Hi, so this is work I'm doing with Gary Choi at the Mahadevan Group at Harvard. And we're working with Claire Spottiswood in Cambridge and her student Ten May Dixit who's doing the experiments in Zambia. So I'm going to talk about a very cool application of morphometry here. So cuckoos, they are nature's cheaters. About 40% of them do not raise their own eggs. Instead, they just put it in somebody else's eggs. And then when the eggs hatch, they throw out all the other eggs in the nest and they finish their mom's job. So you end up with a situation where this little bird is feeding this giant alien baby and thinking that this is her own. And obviously this is not an advantage for this little bird and so you end up with sort of a competition, a co-evolution where the cuckoos are trying to put fake eggs into the nest and the host is trying to reject them and detect them. Okay, so yeah, you can uh, watch about this. Uh, there's this video by Nick Davies in YouTube and he also has a book and there's also this video that's narrated by uh, David Attenborough that you can also find on YouTube. Okay so we're interested in this system with cuckoos and prinias. The, you can see these host eggs on the outside where they've developed a very wide diversity of types of eggs, colors, shapes and patterns and the cuckoos have matched this diversity in, in mimicking these eggs. Except for two things, two features that uh, seem not to be replicated. This color, where actually this color, because the parasites can't replicate it, there's actually been an increase over the last 40 years in the numbers of them, because they have an advantage because they're not uh, parasitized. There's also this feature with squiggles that the, the parasites can't reproduce and you might wonder why isn't the host eggs using that as a binary feature. If there is a line or a squiggle then this is probably my egg. If there isn't then it's not my egg. But they don't do that. And I will talk about, about that a little bit later about why that might be. Another interesting thing about this system is that you have a diversity within the population but each mother has to lay a similar kind of eggs so her eggs need to look the same and actually she learns what her eggs look like the first time she lays eggs she learns that oh this is what my eggs look like so this is an example of learning from a few examples it's called one-shot learning and it's in contrast to uh, big data where you have a lot of examples to learn a pattern here the egg has some sort of model a template model and it learns from only a few examples. Humans do that when we learn a lot of things, when we learn language and so this is an interesting system to study this kind of thing. For the same reason why this is a same, this is a clean system to study co-evolution because everything is happening near the nest. You can see whether the egg gets rejected or not. It's also an interesting system to understand how pattern production happens, which is related to morphogenesis. Also, it's interesting to study pattern learning, pattern perception, and pattern uh, deception. So this is an important problem that allows us to get insight into visual learning and how these things are processed in animals. Okay, so what we will ask here is what kind of visual features are the hosts and the parasites using to imprint and manipulate the signatures on the eggs. Right, so since we don't have a lot of data, we can just um, automatically produce a pattern to learn a pattern like with a neural network. Uh, that, that might be done, but there's on the order of like hundreds or at most a thousand of eggs. No, certainly not in this species. In this species you might have 200 eggs. So the approach that we would take is that we have several well-motivated ways to characterize a pattern. And we're going to go through them and see for each one what kind of insights do we give, do we get from this method. So we will apply them to simulated eggs with squiggles and spots. And we will also apply them to real eggs. And in this talk, I'm just going to focus on this, the first one, Minkowski functionals, because they have interesting properties. They sort of have a mathematical generality in that they generalize the notion of like a volume of the pattern, like the surface area that the pattern is covering. So they're additive, so if uh, it gives you one number for this set, one number for that set, yeah, if the sets are not uh, intersecting, then you get the sum. It, they're also motion invariant, so you get one number for this pattern, and the same number if you just rotate it and move it. And they're continuous, so that if you have something that's almost a circle, it has 
nearly the, th the same value that the circle would have. And the reason why these are interesting and uh, well motivated to use is because of Hadwiger's theorem. And this theorem said anything that satisfies these three properties has to be a linear combination of the Minkowski functionals. And in two dimensions, the Minkowski functionals are just area, perimeter, and the Euler characteristic. So these are all, only three of them. Because of this generality, you find them in many different places. They're used in cosmology to talk about the cosmic microwave background, and they're also used in soil samples and also in statistical physics. Okay, so you might think, well, I only have three numbers. That's not a lot to describe a pattern. Like, if you just, if you're only given three numbers, maybe that's not enough information about the pattern. But what you can do is thresholding. So for every pixel value on the image or on the magnitude on the object, I can say, choose a threshold value, and if the pixel or the, if the intensity is bigger than that, then it's inside my region. If the intensity is smaller than that, then it's outside my region, and you get something that looks like this. Okay, and for every threshold value, you can calculate the area, perimeter, and all the characteristic, and you get something that looks like this. It's a signature of what the pattern on the egg is. And you can see here, for the case where I randomly generated curves on the surface, it has a higher perimeter for the same area. And this is natural, and you expect that. And this suggests why the birds might be using the squiggles. It might be a way to control the signature in the perimeter independently of the area. Okay, so it's a way to get perimeter without covering the surface very much. Okay, and another difference here you see in the perimeter curve, even after you normalize the area or the, the absolute magnitude, you still see that there's jumps. And that's because if a curve has the same kind of intensity, then as you threshold above the intensity of that entire curve, then it just disappears. This might be another signature for the squiggles. And this also gives us a way to explain why the birds don't use this as a binary feature. And that's because if a bird just replicates the signature in the perimeter, then it gets accepted. Okay, so now we can apply this to experimental values. So our collaborators are doing three kinds of experiments. You start with a host eggs and you can put a parasite egg there and just see whether it gets accepted or not and you can um, try to equalize for the color see whether it uh, reacts more to color or to size or to shape or to pattern then you can also add squiggles and spots on the egg and see how that changes things and you can also swap eggs between two different hosts uh, from the same species and see if it accepts it or not Okay, so we're, I'm going to focus mostly on this first one, the first type of experiment. And so these are the kind of results that we get. First, I have to turn the image into grayscale and just have it as intensity values. And uh, here, the, you see the eggs are arranged this way. The purple and the green are host, and the orange is host. And the orange one is exchanged with the blue one, which is coming from a different uh, type of, from a different mother. And then you can look, this one got rejected. And you can see just if you look at the eggs that it looks different. And you can also see the difference in the signature in the perimeter. So that all the uh, host eggs have a peak in the, in the value of the perimeter and that's because they have a lot of squiggles. And you can see they, they, they do generate a lot of perimeter, but this one does not. So you, you do see that here. Okay, and it makes sense that it got rejected. On the other side, this one, it also looks different to your eyes, but it got accepted. And so there, there could be several reasons for that. Maybe the mother is young and ha hasn't learned what her eggs looks like yet, and things like that. But if you look at the signature and the perimeter, you also see that the eggs themselves, the host eggs themselves, vary a lot in this, uh, in this signature. And the parasite egg lies within the variation. So you, you can't detect, there's no obvious difference. The, the, the difference is only at the end there, and that's because of this spot on the egg. There's a very dark spot on the parasite egg, and that's registering in this long tail at the end of the, at the highest threshold. And, but that seems not to change things, because uh, it, it could be dependent on how you normalize the images. So more work is done to understand, should be done to understand what is happening there. 
But so this looks promising. There are 17 experiments of this kind. Out of the 17, 10 got rejected. And for those 10, you can explain, you can look at the signature in the perimeter of seven of them, and they all show like a, you can see the vi difference in the signature in the perimeter curve. And for all the ones that got accepted, uh, the signature lies within the variation of the other curves. Okay, so there are only three that are not explained. And there could be many reasons for that. There could be size, color, and shape. In different species, it's known that the size does matter in terms of uh, rec uh, saying this is my egg or not. But here, I think it's been shown by our collaborator that it's more color explains more the whether the mother is going to reject or not. So this, for example, could be because of the difference in color, and so are these. But also the reason could be that in order to make our images we had to reduce the resolution so that might affect things. Maybe the reconstruction, we need to calibrate the images better. And uh, there might be additional features that we're not accounting for here that would account for why this one got rejected and that one didn't. So there might be additional features to work with. So this looks promising and there's more work to be done and uh, it's not conclusive yet but I will conclude here and say that we have this system where you can study not only coevolution but you can study pattern perception and deception and learning and there's also something that is um, interesting to morphogenesis where the perception and the development of the egg so you the mother ha the host has to produce an egg and change how it produces an egg, develop a signature on the egg, and at the same time change how it processes that visual information. So you have the development of the egg is also coupled to the changes in the visual system. So that's uh, an interesting thing to pursue. So we presented the Minkowski functionals as a way to gain insight into the system and discover what kind of visual features might be involved. They partially explain the results, but more work is uh, to be done, and there's uh, more experiments coming. So thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time.